Thank you. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, <clears throat> two times in three weeks, some of y'all weren't prepared for that. You were like, I don't know. I've, I've, I mean, I know you, you've met your Joey quota for one year or at least a six-month period, and now we're doing this two times in three weeks. So uh, just understand that's what my family has to deal with all the time. Pray for them. <laughs> we are going to, by the way, open with a time of prayer here this morning is, as we do understand, and uh, I said this two weeks ago, I'm not Pastor Chuck, uh, but, uh, but I am honored to get to uh, fill the pulpit and fill this opportunity for him in his place while he is in South Carolina with his wife and, and with their family. As, as Aaron had mentioned a little bit earlier, that they're dealing with a lot of things with uh, his mother being ill and uh, with the fact that they had services yesterday for Stephanie's brother as, uh, as he has passed away. So uh, we want to just, as a church body then, reach out to, to them. I am very thankful uh, that it doesn't matter where we are, that in the spiritual realm, in the fourth dimension, or whatever dimension it, it is, God is, is such a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted God. We're not going to, in this life, be able to figure out all that there is about God. That's when we get an eternity. I really believe, by the way, in eternity, God's going to get to show us something new all the time. We'll never be bored. Never, ever be bored. But we get to reach through the fourth dimension to where Pastor and his wife and his family are in South Carolina. And we want to, as a, a body today, pray for them and bless them. So if we can, let's just do that right now. And, and I'm going to reach forward my hand toward the uh, Facebook Live and toward the broadcast, but it doesn't matter which direction it is. We're just going to reach forward, speak to them, and bless them. So let's do that together as a family today. Father, we thank you that we can speak to the issues that are going on right now. And Father, we just speak over Pastor Chuck's mother right now, life and healing. Your word gives us the words to speak, that with his stripes we were healed. We speak life over her body and, and to every part of her body uh, with which, uh, in which the enemy is attacking her. We speak life right now and healing because it was already paid for on the cross. And Father, we also speak peace because, Lord, you are a God that brings peace. I speak peace over her and over the entire family, that they cast their care upon you because you care for them. You care for them affectionately. You care about them watchfully. And we thank you, Lord, that you take the care away. So, Father, we just speak peace over them right now. And, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we love them and thank you that you love them. We send our love, our care, our, 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 our blessing, our peace through what you've given to us, to them right now. In the name of Jesus, as a body, as a family, we speak life and love and blessing to them right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good that we can do that? We were talking a little bit this morning about worshiping God in spirit and in truth and, and ministering along those lines. It is very, very neat that we can do these things. We're not tied. We're not bound to one place. We can reach out through the Spirit and, and, and bless people and do those kind of things. So I'm really grateful. Um, I want to, we're going to read through John chapter 4 today. And we're going to be talking about a, a number of things that Jesus said and the response to what Jesus said. And I think that if you look closely through this story today, that you'll be able to find yourself somewhere in there, maybe at more than one place. And hopefully as we go all the way through it, we'll find ourselves moving toward the end of it. But before we do that, I'd like to read to you from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 in verse 17. I'll be reading out of the King James today because... That's the Bible I have. That's all there is to it. There's no real <laughs> other story to it. That's what I'm, I'm reading out of today. Romans chapter 10 in verse 7. I'm just kidding. I do appreciate the King James. I was brought up with that. And, and I like to look at a lot of other translations. We'll talk about a couple of them this morning as well. But that's, that's what's in front of me now. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, if you've been in a setting 
in which I've had the opportunity to preach, the odds are so dramatically in the favor of you having heard that passage of Scripture before, you probably should have seen it coming anyway. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I, I, it's almost a joke sometimes when I, when I do read that. I can see sometimes when I say Romans 10, 17, that people who've been around or have heard me minister before are going, so then faith come by hearing. You know, it's, you already know it. You already know it's going to come out. But I want you to really grasp that today and have that as the backdrop for the story in John that we're going to look at. So let's go ahead then with that in mind. As you're turning over to John chapter 4, again, I'll be reading from the King James. It doesn't matter. You'll get the story as we go along. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we talked a couple of weeks ago about the facts, the fact that our worlds are framed by our words. Hebrews chapter 11 says that we know that the world was framed by the Word of God. So our worlds are framed by the Word of God and by our very words. So what kind of words then should we be speaking? That's how we ended a couple of weeks ago, and, and I suggested to you that please go home and practice this. There's, there are times when you, know, you, you have a message and it compels a, a response right then of an altar call in, in some way, shape, or form, or we need to come up and do something about it. And, and I found that often when I have the opportunity to teach that the response is not what happens up here. The response is what happens when we leave the building. The response is what happens when we go from, from here out and this afternoon and this evening and Monday and Tuesday and what you do with it after that. And so you exercise and so you practice. And so I, I want to take that again today. You're going to have an opportunity to exercise and practice some of these things there. I appreciate uh, all the people who have been very helpful. I know that uh, in four of the last five Sundays that the pastor's been gone, and I just want to say that as well, for all the people who have stepped up and, and done everything that's needed to be done to keep a church going and keep a church moving, I appreciate you, and, and uh, it, it just it means a lot. Pastor Chuck also wanted me to pass along to you all this morning how grateful he is for all the phone calls, all the texts, uh, all the, the Facebook messages, everything that's been sent out to him and to Stephanie and to their family and, and you all showing your love to him. He's very much grateful for that as well, and, and he appreciates that. So uh, that's, that's just one of those big deals. I'm, I'm grateful also. It was really neat to get to speak in the youth building. You know, I've done that a time or two here in my day. A lot of them back in the, in the 90s. Uh, some of you may know I was the youth pastor here from 93 to 98 for about five and a half years, I had the opportunity to get to do that and, and uh, to preach back there in that room again was really, really cool. On the other hand, it's nice though to get to go back and use one of these uh, lapel mics again so that I can wave my hands about. You know, we, we watch a program in our house and one of the lines of, of that program, the main character is asked in, at one point, can't you just speak without flapping your arms about? And he says, yes, no. Uh, so that's me. Yes, I, no, I can't. I'm going to move my arms around a little bit, so I'm grateful to be back in here. And also that there's air conditioning. Praise God for air conditioning. That is really, really cool. We, we take things for granted. Have you found John chapter 4 yet? Amen. Seriously? Okay. I'm glad that we... <laughs> Wait a minute, I haven't. Okay, now we have. All right, let's look there. We'll start reading in verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now, that to me is interesting because if you, if you look at a, a, a map, if you ever notice some of the things in Israel at the time, um, where he was in Judea is down here. Where he's going is Galilee up here. Now, Samaria is in the middle. But a lot of the Jews at that point in time, and, and we'll see here a little bit later on, talks about the Jews didn't have a lot of dealings with the Samaritans. So what they would do is they would, instead of going straight through here, they would start down here, cross the Jordan River, go on the east side of the Jordan River, bypass the Samaritans, 
and go up here to Galilee. That's how they take care of things. You ever, any of y'all ever done that? You just didn't want to talk to someone. You'd walk all the way. I mean, you're, you go in the door of Walmart and you see somebody there that you really didn't want to talk to, but you know that you're going back, okay, to find the milk. The direct line to the milk is right here, but you're going to go over here into women's goods. I don't wear those clothes. I have lots of people in my house that wear those clothes, but I don't wear those clothes. But I'm going to walk through women's clothing to avoid this person to find the milk. I'll come back through another way and go back over here in the garden section and check out over there, walk outside even though I parked over here and walk out through the garden entrance. You ever done that? That's what the Jews were doing. But Jesus didn't do that. It said he must needs go through some... You have four daughters. You got congratulated for having four daughters. I have four daughters and a son. I mean, we got an added surprise in that package. Praise God. Anyway, I commend you for your four daughters. But Jesus, the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria. Now, what's really neat about that is the fact that he didn't do anything of his own initiative. In John chapter 5, you read a little bit farther down in chapter 5, and in chapter 8, Jesus said, I do what I see my Father do. I do what my Father says to do. I say what my Father says to say. The reason he went through Samaria was not to, just to try to prove a point of, I don't have to go around the Jordan. He went through Samaria because his Father told him to. Isn't that neat? I, I'm trying to get more to that point in my life where I don't do everything I do just because I want to do it, okay? I'm in my 40s now, and I want to, yeah, I'd like to do a few things right before I move on, but I, I, I want to do that where I'm hearing God because God told me to do something. Sometimes, and maybe I'm not alone here, but sometimes you, know, you look at a situation, there are things going on, and I'm a man, and I want to do something. I want to solve a problem. I want to fix something. And so I, sometimes I just do something just to do something, even if it's not right. I'm doing something. I'm busy doing something. Jody will ask, what are you doing? I don't know, but I'm busy. <laughs> something right has to come out of this. God's going to bless it some way. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus did what he heard the Father do. And so we want to go on, on what God's Word says. So it says, he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city in Samaria, in verse 5, which is called Sychar. Uh, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus at the well, and it was about the sixth hour, around noon. Pretty hot time of the day. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Here is the Samaritan woman. Now, you've probably heard this story a time or two, and we're going to get into this. And there are a lot of different teachings about the Samaritan woman and who she was. And, and I think we're going to see a little bit more into her life today because she's more than just a woman that had an issue. And when we get to her issue, you're going to know it. You've probably already heard it before. And then cometh the woman from Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Four words. Now, in my Bible, those words are read. You want to have a Bible where the words of Jesus are read? I like those Bibles because I think it's really neat because red words win. Red words make a difference. When Jesus says something, again, he didn't just say that. He didn't waste his words. He said, I only say what I hear my father say. He said things because he got word from headquarters as to what he was supposed to say. And if he said something, there was power in that word. Now, I, you look back to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 for just a moment and think about that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I grew up with the King James Bible, and so that's, that's the way I've learned this passage of Scripture. Hearing by the word of God. Hearing by the word of God. And sometimes I key on that word hearing because I think that's important. We need to hear God's word. We need to hear God's word. We need to hear God's word, hearing and hearing and hearing, and it's, and it's a, a present tense thing. It's a continual thing. But I go a little bit farther, and I've looked at some other translations of that, and I, and I see it doesn't always translate directly to hearing the word of God. Sometimes it says hearing the word of Christ. Consequently, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. I look through, and I, I, I like looking through these things. It's a little bit easier now when you have the internet and you can work through translations than pulling out, you know, 17 Bibles. 
uh, out and finding every single one of them. And I was looking through these translations and I found 27 translations that used either the Word of God or the Word of Christ. And I found it interesting that of those 27, nine of them said the Word of God, 18 said Word of Christ. Twice as many of those translations that I, I found there used Word of Christ. We know what Christ is. Christ is Jesus' last name, right? No, it's not Jesus' last name. Some of y'all fell for that, though. You're like, that's right, yeah, Mr. Christ. No, that was not his name. It's a title. Jesus was the Christ. He is the Christ. And, and, and it comes from a different word, Messiah. They mean the same thing. And Christ and Messiah both mean anointed one. Jesus is the one anointed of God, sent of God with the power of God to do what God wanted him to do. That's who Jesus was. He was and is the Christ. And so I find that to be interesting then now looking at this, if I take it from that perspective and I think faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Messiah, hearing by the word of the Christ, everything that Jesus says is important. Now get this, the Samaritan woman was hearing it. She didn't just read this story, she lived this story. She was hearing this and when Jesus said, give me to drink, I submit to you this morning, her faith started increasing right then. She probably never heard Jesus before. She may have heard about Jesus. Word was spreading about Jesus. I mean, we see here in first one that uh, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was baptizing more people than John, even though Jesus wasn't doing it and his disciples were doing it. But word was getting out that Jesus was on the scene doing things. Things were happening. She, didn't, she had never heard that before, but even if she didn't know yet that he was the Messiah, he still was the Messiah. He spoke, her faith is increasing. That's important. So let's look then and look at her reaction then every time Jesus says something and see if you don't find yourself in this. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. So this is a one-on-one -on -one situation here, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus said something. The word of God was presented, and the first thing she went, You talking to me? Are you, are, are you talking to me? She probably had to do a double take. I mean, for more than one reason. Not only was the fact that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have any dealings together, she was a woman. Jesus was a man talking to... Are you... You're talking to me? Have you ever done that? When the pastor's up there speaking, you know, you feel like the, the preacher, whoever it may be, whether it's Pastor Chuck or some evangelist that's brought in to stir everybody up, and they're, and they're saying something, and all of a sudden now they're reading your mail... You ever felt that way? That the speaker is, 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 you know, preaching something and it's like, dude, he came over to my house. He's been spying on me. He knows exactly what's wrong with my life. How dare him preach at me like that? He waited till I came to church before he preached that message. I know that. He saw me come in the back door. Had a whole different message, but he changed it because he saw I was coming. It doesn't really work that way very often. Anyway, uh, no, I'm kidding. I didn't do that. I, I was a senior pastor for three and a half years, and I can tell you that I never, I can almost tell you that I never, I'm just kidding, I, I didn't do that. But when the word of God was preached then, she said, are you talking to me? Are you, are you talking to me? Have you ever done that? When you found a scripture, see this is, you're reading the scripture along, you have time with the word, Amen. raise your hand even if you don't, you have time with the word. This is maybe a faith statement for some of you all. If you have time with the Word, you're reading through, and all of a sudden you see something in there, and you look at it, and, and you almost out loud go, is this for me? Can I have this? Is this for me? Jesus goes on. He answered her and said, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Joseph, or Jacob, excuse me, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus said, If you knew the gift and who was talking to you, if you understood what was going on, 
you'd not just be satisfied with what you're asking or what I'm saying right now, you'd take it a step farther. If you only knew. And the woman asked the question then, oh yeah? Well, what can you do? Who are you, really? Who are you? What can you do? Now it's taken a step beyond, are you talking to me, to take it a step beyond, what can you do about this situation? And I think that's interesting as well because now she starts asking questions. She's starting to dig in a little bit more. Again, everything that I read to you from what Jesus said is in red. Everything he said is starting to increase her faith. Let that sink in just a little bit. Jesus is speaking to her, and with everything he says, her faith is growing because she's hearing the word of Christ. That is so cool. And what's neat about it is she doesn't even know it. To this point, she still doesn't know to whom she's speaking. She doesn't know that her faith is growing, and her faith is growing because she's hearing the word of Christ. Starts to settle in a little bit. She starts asking questions. Why do you think she would be asking questions too? What can you do for me? Are you greater than our father Jacob? What can you do? I would submit to you this morning, I think part of the reason she started asking what can you do is because she knew her situation in life. We're about to get to her situation in life. She knew it. She didn't say anything, but she knew who she was. She knew the mistakes she'd made. She knew the things that were going wrong in her life right then. Are you sure this promise is for me? Do you know who I am? Hmm. Well, did Jesus know who she was? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give to him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give to him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That is cool. In and of itself, and and I realize, understand something, I'm keying on all the parts that the woman said, but let's soak in what Jesus is saying too while we do that and let your faith increase. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said, Whoever drinks of this water shall never thirst. Now she's excited. All right, I want this. That's good. Okay, we're good. I think we've come far enough now that I really, I think you can do this. I didn't know you were talking to me. I didn't know that, that you were greater than our father Jacob, but now I'm starting to get something out of this. Why? Because her faith is increasing with every time she hears the word. Do you, do you see where I'm going? Jesus is going to keep talking here, by the way. With everything she's hearing, her faith is increasing. And Jesus says, all right, I have something to give you. This is going to be great. And she finally says, that's good. I want it. And Jesus said unto her in verse 16, go and call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. All right. Let's break down this little part of the conversation then. So now we've finally gotten to the point where she says, I want this thing that you have to give to me. And Jesus said, all right, here's how you do it. Go do this. Go call your husband and come here. Now remember that, and especially in light of what Aaron had said a little bit earlier. Hi, Aaron. I think it's a church mandate that you're recognized in every message. So I just wanted to go ahead and take care of that right now in case I forgot later on. It's in the bylaws of the church. So it's in the manual. That's in the, okay. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But that's, Aaron talked a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, in our Christian walk, there are responsibilities. There are things that, that we have to do. I was preaching at a church one time when I was younger. And um, I, I, I was winding down. I mean, I had just preached and preached. I was college age. And I was excited to be asked to go there. As a matter of fact, some of the people actually in this building may have been there at the time because it wasn't that far from here. And I was preaching along and I was going, I was excited. I was trying to tell my story and I was trying to to wind down to the fact that, listen, this is important and God loves you for who you are. And it's not what you do that makes God love you. It's, It's, you know, 
because he loves you. And I was talking about the word of God and I was trying to tell, look, there are things in the word to do. It's not all about the things that you're told that you're not supposed to do. And I, I wound up and I got to the point and I was trying to tell him and I said, look, the Bible's not a book of, of don't do's, it's a book of do do's. You were there. I've never been asked back to that church. My heart was right. There are things to do, okay? And Jesus does give this woman something to do, but I want to keep that in mind then as we, as we continue along here. All right, there's something to do now. Jesus said, go tell your husband. Go get your husband and bring him. And she said, I have no husband. What was that? Is that how you do it? Is it like that? I have no husband. <laughs> yeah. Go call your husband and come here. And her response is, um... Now there's an excuse. I can't do what you've asked me to do. Anybody ever come up with an excuse as to why you can't do what God told you to do? I, I can't do that. I can't raise my hands. They're going to look at me. I can't go down front because if I go down front, they're going to think bad things about me. I can't talk to that person I work with her. You can fill in the blank with a whole lot of other things that probably fit home with where you are. She came up with an excuse. He said, go call your husband and have him to come here. She said, well, I don't really have a husband. And Jesus answered, I don't think he skipped a beat. As a matter of fact, it's all in the same verse too. I don't even think he even skipped a beat. You have well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou hast said truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Greatest line in the whole story, by the way. <laughs> Greatest line in the whole story. I love that. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Really? Okay, first off, yes. And the Bible says that he's more than a prophet. It talks about that in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 9, when people said, what did you come out to see? Prophet, you know, the, there, there's, there's more than a prophet here. Jesus is more than that. But I don't think you had to be a prophet to know somebody that's had five men and the one she's with right now isn't even her husband. That's not great news. That's been on the evening news a few times in the gospel columns and everything else. She knew her situation when she said, are you talking to me? I'm not going to unload on you all. Some <laughs> sigh of relief there from everyone. But I know where I've messed up in life. I know the things that I've messed up in lately. I know the areas that I have to fight to not mess up with in the future. I know my situation. And when I read the Word of God and the promises that are in there for me, sometimes... The enemy is really good at saying, do you know who you are? I may not have had five wives and the one I'm with right now isn't my wife, but there may have been other things. Jesus didn't tell her that to make her feel bad. He told her that because he just knew. Yeah, you don't have a husband. The guy you're with right now isn't your husband. You always wonder about those things too. I mean, you know, there could be lot, and there could be lots of reasons. She just could be one of those women that just got around. You know? She just, hey, you know. Next. <laughs> like you weren't thinking it. <laughs> she could have been hard to deal with. I know you've heard this story before, but uh, I mean, I, I, I heard the story recently and it, it reminded me, she could have been just one of those women that was very hard to deal with, okay? And why would one, it just, you know, one at a time, that's one of those things, one at a time, why do they keep coming on? You know, the story in the Bible about the, 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 the man in the Old Testament that slew a thousand people, he slew a thousand people. If you're that thousandth person and 999 guys before you are laying there on the ground dead, what makes you think, I can take him? 
I got this. I just am wondering about this sixth guy, you know? She's been so hard to deal with with five other men. He goes, that's all right, I can fix her. I'm reminded of that story that uh, the woman that wasn't a very, very nice person and, and she'd gone to Walmart. Walmart, by the way, today's message is brought to you by. But Walmart, <laughs> she goes to Walmart and she's like, she's mad because the lines are long and she's upset because the people are not treating her well. And so she just, you know, gets a, she came for a can of peaches. She just leaves the can of peaches. She takes it. She steals it, you know, and she's caught. She goes before the judge, hearing, you know, lots of people come in. They didn't like her. They saw her up there. They wanted to see what's going to happen. The judge says, you steal that can of peaches? She said, sure did. Stole it. Mad, tick, that's just the way I am, and you people are mean. Well, the judge thought about it a little bit, and he said, I'll tell you what. How many, how many peaches are in that can? How many peaches were in that can? She said, well, there were five. The judge said, okay, tell you what. This is what you're going to do. You're going to spend a night in jail for every one of those peaches that were in that can. Her husband, by the way, was in the proceeding as well. He was watching all this that was going on. He raised his hand and said, Sir, she stole a can of peas, too. <laughs> I don't know if this was this woman. It may have been. But Jesus said, you know, you've had five husbands. The dude you're with right now isn't even your husband. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I'll tell you what. Let's find out a little bit more about this. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. I'm wondering, at the first time I read that, I kind of wanted to know, is she really just testing him in this? Because if he really is a prophet, is she going to, you know, at one point in time, how many fingers am I holding up? You know, that kind of thing. But now she's taking it really, though, it's a step further. Because what's been happening to her every time Jesus talks, even when he said to her, you have had five husbands, and the dude you're with right now isn't even your husband. I'm telling you right now, that was the word of Christ. What happened? Faith came. Faith came every time Jesus spoke. So she wasn't just asking him for some kind of sign. You know, at this point, faith's starting to build up on the inside of her. Okay, I perceive that you're a prophet. You must know something. Our fathers worshiped out here. You say, the Jews say we're supposed to worship over here. What are we supposed to do? Now Jesus really gets into this. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is the biggest part of this message that Jesus is getting across to her. I mean, He's getting some serious Bible teaching in right here. And this is the part of this story that oftentimes we focus on. At lots of times, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll quote John 4, 24 regularly. God's a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I kind of key on the God's a spirit thing because I'm glad about that because he's a spirit, I'm a spirit. We can go and, and we can know one another, and, and that's great. I am so glad that I don't have to have somebody send off to Jerusalem, which is across an ocean and somewhere else out there, to go before God for me. He's a spirit, and in the spiritual realm, he can be everywhere. That's one of the greatest things about Jesus going away. After Jesus was here on the earth, and then he died on the cross, and he was risen again, and he went back up, and what did he do? He sent a comforter who can be everywhere. Jesus in his physical form couldn't be everywhere, but the Holy Spirit can. And Jesus seated on the throne of, uh, on the right hand of the throne of God right now, always making intercession for me, can take care of everything I need all the time right now. God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But even he takes it to say, look, it's not about where you do it. It's about how you do it. Amen. It's about what's on the inside that counts. I grew up in church. I mean, I grew up, I mean, I, I wasn't born in church, but you'd think I was. My parents taught, we, we went to church all the time. All the time, every time the church was open. We had keys, we'd open the church. 
I, when, when I was in my early teens, my mother played the piano. She was an amazingly talented woman, uh, vocally and, and uh, um, instrumentally. She could play anything that had keys. Uh, she was one of the, she, you know, she, she'd play an accordion. She's five foot three. If you can picture this five foot three woman with an accordion out there, she would go places. We'd go to like brush arbors and stuff like that. Some of y'all know what those are. <laughs> No air conditioning. Anyway, she would go to these places, and we'd go outside, and they'd call her in to play. Why? Because she could play, and she'd, there's no piano. That's all right. We have an accordion. So she'd play the accordion out there, and, and we'd do this. She would go play for other churches because there, there, sometimes there were churches that didn't have a piano player, so she'd go. So there was a time in my life that we would go to the church that we were going to in, in Ardmore for the morning service, and then we would go to, uh, excuse me, we'd go to Hilton in the morning service because she was playing the piano for them, which Hilton's about you know, 30, 40 miles away from Ardmore. Then the church we were meeting at met on af- in the afternoons because we didn't have a church building, so we met in somebody else's building, but the only time to meet there on Sundays was in the afternoon. So we'd go eat lunch and we'd meet in our church on Sunday afternoon. Ah, but there were Sunday night services, so we'd drive back to Hilton so mom could play the piano again. I'm telling you, I grew up in church. If I never went to church again in a building, I've still fulfilled my responsibilities. But because of that, sometimes I feel the need to do. I've got to be doing something. Do, do, do. Sometimes people who weren't brought up in church but get to know Jesus later in life don't have the same, we, we all have different baggage. My baggage is church baggage because sometimes I feel the need to do. God didn't call me to do to be in his presence. We've been talking about things that you do. Aaron's right, we have responsibilities. We have things we need to do for the kingdom of God. Faith without works is dead. We're called to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Both of those things you can find in James. Look those up. We're called to be a doer of the word, but we're not called to be a doer to be in God's presence. We just get in God's presence. He said those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word worship in this passage comes from a Greek word, proskuneo, which means by kneeling or prostration to do homage, to make obeisance, that we kneel even within ourselves before the presence of God, that we recognize who we are and say, God, you're God and I'm not. And no matter where I am, I don't always physically kneel. I, I physically kneel sometimes because I, I, I like to. I think it's good. There's there's something to that, to just kneeling in the presence of God, and I take the time to do that. I can't kneel while I'm driving down the road, but it's not all. But I can pray and be in and worship in God's presence, recognizing that He's God. I'm not. I submit myself to you right now as God. I am just taking the time to make and let you know that you're God. And I worship even when I'm in my car. I can worship when I'm sitting up. I can worship when I'm when I'm doing something else. It's not about your physical manifestation because God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the, I think it's neat that the Greek word for both, both parts of that scripture where it says God is a spirit and where it says that we must worship him in spirit and in truth, our spirit. In my King James, it capitalizes spirit there in the first one. The second one is lowercase s, but they're both the same word. We worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're all one spirit. The Word says that who's joined to the Lord in spirit is one with Him. Now you can, again, my, my son, who by the way is the best little boy on the planet, best, Barna, sorry, he is the best little boy on the planet. I mean, I'm telling you what, there's just, there's nothing like him. And when we pray lots of times, and he's 11, when we pray lots of times, he'll still do this. He'll just stop what he's doing, He'll close his eyes and he'll do this. One of his sisters one time got up and said, Jake, you don't have to do that. And he just looked at him. Of course, he started to tear up a little bit because he's like, I mean, he's being reverent before God. And I 
had to say, no, he doesn't have to, but he chooses to, and that's okay. And God honors that. I believe God honors that. You know, he's a, we're, we're, we're all spirit. We worship in spirit and in truth, and we come before God in, in spirit to do so with our inner being. The word spirit there is from a Greek word, pneuma, P-N-U-E-M-A, pneuma, has to do with your inner being, with your inner breath. What did God do when, when he made man? He formed man and he breathed the breath of life into him. That's cool. That really is good. One more thing, too, as we stay there and we start to wrap up. I promise I'm wrapping up. I promise I'm wrapping up. God, that's one. There we go. God never changes, and he never changed. God in the New Testament is the same God that was in the Old Testament. You all realize that? The Word says in John, 1 John chapter 4, in verses 8 and in verse 16, that God is love. That is a, a passage of Scripture that I regularly quote as well. If, you, if you've heard that one time, you've probably heard it a thousand times, that God is love. I, but God doesn't change. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in James, that's talking about Jesus. In James, we go to the Father also, and we read in verse 1 in chapter, er, in chapter 1 in verse 17, I'll get it right, that, that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is neither, neither variableness nor shadow of turning, God never changes. God is love right now in the New Testament in the time in which we live. God is love in the Old Testament. Just didn't, maybe didn't see it as much with all the stories we get because we read stories of plagues and fire and brimstone and all these other things that are going on and fire out of heaven. And, but God still love. We just get to see Him more as the Spirit that He is in the time in which we live. Old Testament time was all about the, the, the flesh and all about things that you had to do. We live in a New Testament time. Why? Because Jesus tore the, the, the veil's been torn down because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we don't have to go into that physical presence anymore. We walk as, as spirits and, and that God is a spirit. Okay, so we start to look. So the Samaritan woman, and again, what's been building up the whole time Jesus has been talking? Faith. Everything he said, her face been building up. She's just about there. I know that Messiah is coming. First, now she perceived he's a prophet. Now she's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all these things. And she left the door open for him. And what did Jesus say in verse 26? Jesus said unto her, I that speaketh to thee am he. Boom. That was the tipping point for her. That was the final thing. Jesus said, I am he. I like that. In the Old Testament where, where Moses said, who am I supposed to tell him that you are, God? I am. I am. Jesus said, I am he. And what happened next with her? She left and she, what'd she do? She did what he told him to do. Her faith had finally reached that tipping point. She's hearing the word and hearing the word and hearing the word. And you don't know when that tipping point's going to come. That's such a cool thing. In Galatians chapter 5, we're supposed to not be weary in well-doing. Why? Because in due season, in due season, you're going to reap a reward. When's due season? I have no idea. I have no idea when your due season is. I don't know when my due season is. I'm telling you right now, I've got a due season for a few things. I mean that. I've seen, I mean, I, the things I, that, that my family and I, that we're dealing with, I've seen some blockages in some areas. I've seen some things that, why is this going on like this? There's a due season coming because I'm still believing God and trusting God. There is a due season that co comes if we don't get weary in our well-doing. There's a due season. What's that tipping point? The tipping point for her was, I am he. And she went and she told people. You read the story on down here. Let's, let's wrap this up. And the disciples came and, and, and they, you know, looked around. The, but in verse 28 it says, The woman then left her water pot. She stopped what she was doing 
and went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? I think she exaggerated a little bit because the, she didn't want everybody to tell everything that she'd ever done. But anyway, she said, look, this guy told me the things that I'd done. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And you read on down through the story. And then in verse 39, it says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. This is one of the first evangelists in the Bible. And she's a Samaritan and she's a woman. I like women, by the way. point that out. I have to. I mean, I live with seven, nine, twelve. Even my daughter has a daughter. We went in to to the, to the, uh, when she got the sonogram, first time that JC got the sonogram, we went in there and the doctor, you know, they do the little thing and poke around and there's a little stick and you're looking at a TV screen and here's the movie of this and over here and there's this blob of something and you're like, oh, that's so pretty. You have no idea what this thing is. It's a blob. And they say, oh, well, she's, and here's the head, and here's, and here's the little girl part, boy part, whatever the case may be. And, and she said, okay, well, the baby is this far along. That's great. Do you want to know what the baby is? And, well, it's a little girl. I looked, I'm not kidding. Back me up on this, Carol. I looked at the woman, and I said, of course it's a girl. <laughs> Why are we here doing this? This is just a charade. We know it's a girl. She was one of the first evangelists in the Bible. She went and told people and they believed because of what she said. And then he read on down here. And the Samaritans were coming to him and they besought him that he would tarry. Jesus stuck around two days. There's a whole message in that. Jesus stuck around for two days. You realize Jesus was here for three and a half years, but two days he stuck around in Samaria and just talked to him. And many more believed because of his own word. And then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of you, but because of that. Jesus stuck around. He did something. The, the, the tipping point finally came about and stump, something happened. Okay? Your tipping point may be different. Hers, she heard and she heard and she heard and she heard. And finally something happened. She went and did. And people got saved. Stuff happened. For Peter, you ever wonder about that? Peter's out there on the boat. And, 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 and the storm's happening. It wasn't just Peter. All the disciples were out there. Jesus had just got through hearing about John the, the Baptist and that he had been killed. He goes up on the mountainside. He's needing some time alone. And he sends the disciples over. The disciples go over in a boat. Storm comes. I mean, it's a supernatural storm. Their, their stuff's happening. They're going to sink. This is a bad, bad situation. They look up. They see Jesus walking on the water. They don't know if it's Jesus or not. They're completely freaked out. Jesus walks on the water. And they're saying, that's not a ghost. And Jesus said, no. Or they say, it's a ghost. Jesus said, no, it's I. And Peter said, <laughs> Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come on the water. Now, there are so many different things about this story that, that, that we hear. If you're one of the other disciples, don't you just want to go, Peter, what are you doing? Lord, if it's you, cause the storm to stop. I don't know what he's talking about. He can walk on the water in his spare time. Would you please stop the rain? No, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. How many words did Jesus use at that point in time? One. This many. He said, come. And for Peter, that was the tipping point. That's all he needed. I'm telling you, Peter had been hearing the word of Jesus. Disciples had been feeding people. 5,000 people had gotten fed. People were being healed. This is happening. All this is going on. Peter's faith is built up. And all he needed at that point was one word. Come. Got out of the boat. Walked. Yeah, we know the rest. He <laughs> And Peter beginning to sink. Have you ever let that sink in, by the way? Beginning to sink. How do you begin to sink? I have never begun to sink in my life. I just sank. Peter beginning to sink. He's just walking along. You wonder how, how did he begin to sing? Jesus reached out and picked him up. That's really cool. All he needed was one word. That was the tipping point in his life. Faith had been coming in and coming in again. She was one of the first disciples, excuse me, one of the first evangelists because she heard the word of God and she acted on it. I believe, though, that Jesus' message never went away from her. What was Jesus' message to her? God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The time is coming, and now is. 
and now is, and now is, we worship God in spirit and in truth. So as we wrap this up then, I want to encourage you today, this afternoon, one, worship the Lord. Amen. Why? Because you can. God is a spirit, and we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. You have the opportunity today, without ever coming in this building again, to worship God. To take some quiet time and say, God, you're God and I'm not. God, I bow before you on the inside. You're God. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. Whatever you want me to say, that's what I want to say. But I just want to take a time right now, God, and recognize you and say, you sure are good. I worship you. I love you. You're love, God. I'm so glad I get to see you for who you are as love. I encourage you to do that. And I also encourage you to hear the word of God again. Find a way. Even if you get your husband or your wife or your kids to go, hey, read that to me. Jesus said this. Read it out loud to me. I want to hear it. Why? That might be your tipping point. That could be the time when you see your breakthrough because it was just that much faith and it pushed you over the edge. The last thing Jesus said, all he had to say to her was, I'm he. She took off. She left her water pot. She stopped what she was doing. She went out, preached. People got uh, changed. They believed. I, say, I was going to say they got saved. We know Jesus had to go to the cross. We know that at that point in time, they hadn't been saved yet, but they believed on him as being the Christ. Right? So keep that in mind. Okay? You do those two things, I'm going to do those two things today. I encourage you to do the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word. And thank you so much for what it is doing on the inside of us. And Father, even as, as I have spoken, we've all heard, so our faith increases. And we're thankful for that. And we choose to worship you as spirit beings to worship you, the spirit. And just say, thank you, Father. We speak blessing over Pastor Chuck and Stephanie and their family. And we continue to thank you for what you are doing for them. I speak blessing over this congregation today to speak your word and that our worlds are framed by your words, we want to speak your words today. And we believe you for it. We're thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. It is high noon.